Hey guys, this is the first um, screencast, and then there's going to be a fourth part, and we're going to cover parts two and three in class. So when we talk about ecosystem stability, um, we're talking to the way that it either changes or doesn't change over time. So we have two different things, inertia and resilience. So inertia is the ability to actually resist it, and then resilience is that ability to bounce back afterwards. And then we have keystone species, and this is, when you're thinking of keystone species, you think of an arch at the top of, there we go. So if we have an arch, okay, and you build it with stones, that keystone from art history is this stone that's right here up top. So if you end up pulling this out, then what happens is the whole thing collapses. So that's kind of the theory behind a keystone species. So your example are elephants. They can alter the entire structure of vegetation and they uh, preserve the grasslands by eating the small trees and they actually keep the grasslands grasslands. Sea otters are another absolute huge keystone species. So it starts out with your kelp, which are your producers eaten by your kelp crab, which are your primary consumers then your sea otters, which are your secondary consumers, okay? Um, and your sea urchins are also your primary consumers. When you take your sea otters out of the picture, what happens is your sea urchin population goes up, which means that all of your kelp gets eaten, and the kelp is the basis of that food chain. So without the kelp, everything goes kaput. Other examples are wolves the American alligator, and beavers. So make sure that you go through these examples. Next, we're talking about biodiversity or biological diversity. We have the three levels. So we have the smallest, which is genetic, the differences in genetics. Then we have species, which we spoke about a little bit during the theory of island biogeography. So you have richness and evenness. Richness is how many species, and evenness is how many of those within the species there actually are. And we're going to go into way more detail of these during your parking lot diversity lab. And then the last one is ecosystem diversity. So that's the differences in your ecosystems, your rainforest versus your desert. And we're talking about all this biodiversity, but why do we actually need biodiversity? And um, it's really good and important for requiring ecosystem stability. So if one species goes endangered or extinct, what happens is there's something else to fill its spot. Another thing is, is that they're usually able to better withstand disturbances. So they have better inertia and better resilience. And a huge amount now of effort is being put into actually maintaining biodiversity. Whereas before, you know, like the passenger pigeon, we just kind of let that go extinct. Whereas now we're really realizing that they play a vital role in the ecosystem. So here we have low diversity systems. So we have things that are called monocultures, mono being one, our single species crops. This is what we typically see when we're talking about our own crops. Very low species diversity, and they're very vulnerable to disease, pests, and disturbance. Think about it. If you have a whole monoculture of corn, which we see all over the place, and if it gets the corn beetle, then what happens is the corn beetle eats everything. It's this huge buffet. In nature, we have things like um, the savanna, as you see in this picture over here. And it seems like it's a monoculture, but it actually is pretty diverse. In total contrast, our high diversity ecosystems are exactly what you're thinking of. And you're thinking of tropical rainforests, which are the most diverse ecosystems in the world. These happen at low latitudes. So that's your zero, that's your equator and at low, low altitudes, so lower down mountains, not higher up mountains. They um, have a very high ability to resist, um, they have a very high inertia and very high resilience. So they are quite resistant to disturbance, but a lot of times once you cut them down, especially clear cutting, they do not recover well. Next, we have how to actually calculate diversity. So when we did the theory of island biogeography, we had uh, a measure of richness and a measure of evenness. And what we could have done was we could have plugged that into something called the Simpsons Index, which would have given us a number between zero and one, and it would have been able to tell us the diversity of one community versus the next. And the thing is, is actually measuring the amount of biodiversity is something that's really hard to do in an ecosystem. 
Um, when we're talking about why we need this genetic diversity, huge. I mean, we're humans, we are selfish, so a lot of this has to do with what we need this ecosystem for. So a lot of times with genetic engineering, well, all times with genetic engineering, we incorporate genes from one organism into another one. And we do this to provide vaccines, more productive farm animals, agricultural plants with desirable characteristics. And if we don't have the genes to take from to make these new species, then we don't get these new species. It's really, really important to protect this diversity for ourselves as selfish humans, but also for biodiversity itself and the ecosystem. So here's just one example of why biodiversity is super important. So there's an anti-cancer drug called Taxol, and it was initially farm in the, found in the bark of the Pacific yew tree, which is the Northwest old growth coastal regions of the US. And it was discovered in 1967. However, these trees, you're not just gonna go cut them down because one tree, one 40 foot tree that takes about 200 years to reach that height, yields only a half a gram of the Paxlotel, which is what you need for that anti-cancer drug. And um, Plaxitel was actually brought to the market in 1993 as Taxol. You know, you've got those uh, generic names. And what they were able to do is actually synthetically make it. But if we didn't have this biodiversity, we would have never been able to dis discover it in the first place. So for example, we need this biodiversity because it provides us with these ecosystem services. So we need to breathe clean air, we need clean water, and we need fertile soil. All of these things are provided to us through these ecosystems. Forests, what they do is they take in carbon dioxide to sequester it, whether for hundreds or thousands of years, and they create oxygen, and they expel oxygen into the atmosphere, which obviously we need to breathe. Same thing with water, the soil and um, and the ecosystems actually filter this water for us. And then you have other contributions like food, clothing, shelter, pollination of crops. Without bees, we wouldn't have our fruits and vegetables because bees pollinate those crops. So now with the declining bees, we're having really big issues with pollinating our crops. As you saw in the previous slides, you have those antibiotics and those medicines that we would never find if we didn't have this biodiversity. And biological processes like nitrogen fixation, which we need then to grow crops to provide ourselves with food. Declining biodiversity is a huge issue. It's of concern throughout the U.S., but in the U.S. it's most serious in Hawaii and California. Hawaii, because it's more of a tropical area. California, 29% of the species are at risk. This is definitely because of human activities. And also right now, it's hugely because of the drought, which has been brought on by human activities. Globally, it's most serious in the tropical rainforest. So we're talking Central, South America, Central Africa, Southeast Asia. All of these areas have this huge amount of biodiversity. So when those areas get hit the worst, what happens is we're losing insane amounts of species. So here is a really, really great image because this shows you hot spots of biodiversity. So these areas highlighted in red are areas that are very biodiverse or they're really, really at risk. There are about 25 different regions of hot spots of biodiversity. And these are areas that are that are especially protect, protected and they're trying to really protect these areas because it's like 70% of the biodiversity in the world is actually contained in these areas that are highlighted, which is insane. This is moving more on to what we're gonna be doing on Thursday. We're talking about endangered and threatened species, uh, extinctions, extinct in the wild and extant. These are just vocab words. And what we have here are some characteristics of endangered species. So some species are more prone to becoming endangered than others. And these are some of the reasons. It has an extremely, extremely small range. So they're only found in certain areas to begin with, or they're endemic, okay? So like that number three down, they live on an island, okay? As you guys saw today. Um, but endemic means that they only exist in that one area. And especially those hot spots of biodiversity have lots of endemic species that only exist in those areas. Think of the dodo bird. It only existed on the island of Mauritius. And once they were gone from the island of Mauritius, they couldn't migrate in from anywhere else. Another thing is requiring a large territory because what goes on is we are actually taking habitat 
which we're going to talk about tomorrow. And so these animals that need this large territory just don't have it anymore. Um, having low reproductive success, meaning that maybe not a lot of their offspring live. They have a small population size to begin with, so they don't have that genetic diversity. Um, low reproductive rates, meaning that they only maybe reproduce once every couple years. And another thing is requiring specialized breeding areas. If those areas are wiped out, then the species is wiped out because they have no place else to breed, and most likely they're not going to be able to adapt. Same thing with has specialized feeding habitats. Um, the best example here are pandas. Pandas eat bamboo, and they eat very specific bamboo that dies off once every 30 years, and all of them almost starve to death. So with their very super specialized feeding habits, you have these, this animal that doesn't have much of a chance of survival because of what's going on in China with the bamboo forests. Okay, so um, so come in, make sure you know this information. You guys are going to have to answer a couple do now questions on this stuff. And uh, we're going to go into HIPCO. And then on Friday, we're talking all about rhinos.